And we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Mr. Ramsey. Question one, Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to advise that not only is the Chinese market already open for dairy products from the north, but also that it is thriving. In 2013, 3,613 tonnes of dairy products such as butter, cheese and milk powder were exported from the north to China. In 2014, 3,918 tonnes have already been exported and I'm very pleased to see that upward trend. Overall, dairy exports have increased by 30% this year and my officials continue to closely work with our industry to facilitate this growing trade. In addition, significant quantities of raw milk are used in the production of dairy product products in the south, which may, they, may then be ex exported to China. My officials have established an international trade dairy group with their counterparts in the south to ensure that trade of these types of products is facilitated. At the most recent meeting, officials agreed new processes which ensure that um, the support that we give the industry across the island of Ireland is a lot more joined up. Well, Mr Ramsey, for supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for her detailed response, and it is most welcome. Would the Minister be aware that the Irish Government, Agriculture, Simon Coveney, visited China recently and has great, brought, brought great hope to the many food producers in the south? There is a hope and desire that our own Minister would also take the opportunity to visit China to promote the same concept and increase that quantity and quality of, of produce that's going to China. Um, of Simon Coveney and, and the delegation that went out. Um, the member will be aware that I've actually been twice to China myself to explore the market and to make links um, with the Chinese um, government and also trade. Um, I, I actually intend, um, hopefully very early in the new year, to make another trip to China particularly in terms, not just for the dairy um, industry, but obviously that's a very vital industry, but also to look at some of the challenges we're having in terms of um, getting export certificates signed off with the Chinese officials. So we we, I've actually recently written to our friends in China and asked for some movement on that because particularly the pork industry has been very disappointed by the continuous um, cancellation of inspection visits by the Chinese vets. So we're hopeful to get that progressed as, as quickly as possible. And as I say, um, there is some scope and work doing, being done at the moment to see um, if there be scope in myself going out in early January to, to pursue the markets further. Call Mr. Declan McAleer. Good morning, uh, Could the minister tell us are there any new uh, dairy export markets being considered? Good yeah, um, I'm pleased to note that there are a significant number of dairy export markets that, as I said, are already open for, for products from the north and indeed from across the island. Um, these include access to the new emerging economies of India and of China. There's also a planned inspection by the Brazilians in December who will visit dairy exporters um, interested in exporting in, in England, Scotland and Wales. And whilst our industry has indicated that they are currently not planning to export to Brazil, um, this inspection will hopefully provide a new lucrative market for them in the future. Well, Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, given the current depressed markets for dairy produce uh, across Europe, and given the importance, importance of the dairy sector to the Northern Ireland economy, uh, has the Minister met with our three MEPs to look at a possible way forward? I haven't met with the three MEPs in terms of um, specifically talking about the dairy sector, but I'm all, my door is always open and I'm very keen to engage them, particularly um, with the discussions that happen in Europe. I'm very aware that um, one of the MEPs that's involved in the new dairy report, and will obviously, um, on an official level, we've already been um, inputting into that. But you're absolutely right, the crisis in the dairy sector is a very real one. The, the issues concerning price and managing cash flow and all the other issues that are there for the dairy sector. And I'm certainly, in terms of my department's role, are, are certainly um, up for playing our role in whatever shape or fashion that may take in supporting that sector to grow. You'll be aware that um, under the Going for Growth um, strategy that there's a number of initiatives that will support the industry in, in going forward. It's so important that we tackle the underlying issues of profitability, that we look towards um, production efficiency, and I'm certainly, as I said, up for playing our role within the department in terms of taking that forward. And we've done a lot of work around knowledge transfer, education and training, and we'll continue to do that. Um, over the next wee while. I'm also actually meeting, um, incidentally, uh, UEFU tomorrow to discuss the actual um, issues pertinent to the dairy sector, and I look forward to that discussion. I've also um, hoped to have a conversation over the next couple of days with the DEFRA Secretary, um, Elizabeth Truss, particularly in relation to the dairy industry also. So we're coming at it fr from a number of fronts and trying to support the industry in what is obviously a very difficult time, given the prices in October this year compared to last year are somewhat about 30% of a difference, so that's quite significant for the industry. Call Mrs Joanne Dobson. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Unfortunately, the Republic has been allowed to get ahead in building routes into the Chinese market. Can the Minister give a commitment as the Agricultural Minister in this executive on the issue of the Chinese market? She sees the Republic of Ireland as nothing other than a major competitor. Ideology mustn't get in the way of standing up for our farmers and the agri sector. Typical nonsense politics um, arguments. The, the reality is what we need to do is work together across the island to get into these markets. That's the reality of the situation. The industry want to see that. There's a very strong growth there with, um, right across the island. I, as I said in the initial answer, there's quite a significant amount of trade that happens across the island, which is why we have a north-south um, our counterparts in my department and in Daphne work together to um, assist the industry to grow. There are absolutely opportunities given the quota situation post um, or next year. So th there's opportunities for us to explore there. I'm certainly up for working with the industry. I think what we need to see is a dairy led strategy and I, as part of that we'll be working right across the island. So I don't think that the members should get hung up too much on ideological position. This is in fact a trade issue and an, and an issue where we can work together quite successfully across the island. Well, Mr. Gregory Campbell for a question. Number two, Deputy Speaker. I can advise the member that as a result of the soft market and testing exercise on the Shackleton site by the Office of First and Deputy First Minister earlier this year, that over 40 expressions of interest were received, principally from the private sector, although there were some partnership and public sector interests. OFMDFM has given consideration to uses for the wider Shackleton site as part of the plans to develop it. Mr. Campbell for a supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I know initially the Minister was somewhat uh, lukewarm on the move to the site, but it's always uh, a welcome development when a politician does the right thing. And in doing the right thing, you should always do the right thing and keep on doing it. Whether there are threats, online abuse or anything else, keep doing the right thing. And that's what I intend could to have do. A but question, ask, please? If I could ask the Minister, in terms of the contribution that the public purse has had to put in to the development of the Ballykelly site, would you now ensure that along with the OFM DFM that swift progress is made to try and deploy the rest of the site to the best utilisation of it? Well, the member um, is aware that I am very much committed to the project moving forward, that I have made headquarters relocation one of my principal priorities, which is why I made it a programme for government commitment. I have always, since taken up office, and my predecessor, Michelle Gillenew, have always been um, of the view that we need to move our headquarters um, to a rural location to bring us closer to our service users and for all the knock-on benefits that we've always talked about. This is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. This is about giving opportunities to those in the public service to gain promotional opportunities. So the benefits speak for themselves. I have always been committed to this project. I have um, set out my stall in terms of taking it forward and I will do so in the time ahead. OFM, DFM um, are the principal department in terms of developing the entire site, but obviously the move by DARD to the Ballykelly site will have and will attract, and that's obvious from the expressions of interest, other people to the site, and, and I'm quite sure that will happen over the next number of years. And this is going to be a long-awaited um, investment in the northwest, with those people <coughs> are entitled to and have been robbed of for years. Well, Mr. Joe Byrne. Here are you. Chairman, can the Minister outline when will the outline business case be completed and when will the cost benefit analysis be conducted? The outline business case has been cleared by DARD's internal assurance processes and executive approval to proceed was given on the 26th of June 2014 by FM and DFM. The business case outlines the options for relocating the headquarters to Ballykelly and the business case was informed by a report from Central Procurement Directorate on the accommodation options available on the Shackle and Barks site. An assessment of equality impacts of relocation and the modelling of the required staff transition to the new headquarters while incorporating opportunities provided by modern ICT as appropriate. The preferred option points to a phased approach to a construction with a 400 workstation being completed in 2017 and a further phase of around 200 workstations being completed in 2020. The total cost of the phased option is 30.8 million capital and 14.3 million resource. The funding gap is 29.7 capital and 11.3 million resource. The current work programme for the work at Ballykelly indicates that the tender award for construction will happen at the end of 2015. And prior to that, my officials will develop the outline business case into the full business case. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Given the extreme pressure on public finances, uh, not least on our hospitals and schools, can I ask the Minister to outline the total estimated cost of this project? And does she accept that it is not appropriate in such austere times? No, I don't accept it. 
I think that the principal point here is that this is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs. This is about better promotional opportunities for the, the public service. This is about uh, ensuring that there are opportunities right across the north and we have a, a better um, distribution of public sector jobs. That for me is key and that is the, the principle that should guide us in terms of moving forward. I have set out our stall in relation to Bally Kelly for the headquarters, fisheries going to um, South Down, Rivers Agency going to Lockery and Cookstown and Forestry going to Fermanagh. I am absolutely committed to taking those projects forward. I have set that out in budget plans and moving forward. Um, we are absolutely in austere times. This is a um, difficult economic climate because, and you always have to put it back to the context, the context of what we're dealing with is the onslaught on the budget from the Tory government. There are different, difficult decisions to be taken. I'm absolutely up for taking the, the first and most balanced approach I can, but I can assure the member that I am committed to these relocation projects. Call Mrs. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister tell the House if the redeployment has taken into consideration the surplus staffing positions within the Department and the impending voluntary exit schemes? Yes, absolutely. As part of the planning and moving forward, um, we've been working very closely with the trade union side to make sure that staff are fully um, up to speed with all the moves that are happening and the implications for them. And we're working with our staff. We have surveyed staff both in headquarters but right across all um, elements of the department. And there's also been a wider um, public service um, survey also, which is all fed in. And we're very much um, committed to taking forward the phased approach which allows for any staff changes that may, may happen. The, in terms of the voluntary redundancy scheme, we still don't have all the details of that, but obviously that will become more clear from DFP over the next number of weeks. And I, I'm quite sure that um, there will be a number of people right across my department and other departments that would want to take up that opportunity. Um, and we have to work our way through all that with DFP over the next number of months. But I'd say that we're talking about um, towards the middle of next year before we know the numbers of staff from each department that will go under the voluntary scheme. Mr. Mike Nesbitt for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three. My officials are discussing all of my department's budget 2015-16 um, proposals, including savings at the Ard Committee tomorrow, and we aim to publish Ard's draft budget consultation document on our website on Wednesday, and full details can be viewed then. Delivering savings of almost £30 million will be challenging for my department. However, I have been engaging with officials regularly over the last number of months to develop what, uh, the most balanced approach to implement any of the savings that have to be found. The approach focuses on the operating costs of the department, including general running costs and staffing levels in areas as well as programme expenditure. I have also set targets to raise additional income to ensure the future sustainability of, key service, of the key services that are delivered by my department. Call Mr Nesbitt for supplement. Well, I thank the Minister for, for her answer. She will be aware in the previous programme for government there was a commitment from her department uh, to cut 15 per cent off administration. Her predecessor managed less than a third of that. So how does she justify a further 2.4 million being spent on administration uh, from 2011 to the current year? Well, obviously, every department needs an element of administration, not least my department, given that we administer almost £300 million of single farm payments to farmers. We need to make sure that we have the staff and the expertise there to be able to deliver that. And I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we protect that revenue that we receive for the farming and rural communities, not just the £300 million, but also the rural development programme. We're looking across the department at savings that may be found. I am working to try and protect frontline services as best that we can to make sure that we take a look at how we deliver services, can we improve things. So that's constantly on the review, as is the constant um, look at where we're duplicating services, um, where we can find efficiency and where we can do things better. Well, Mr Edwin Putz. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Will the, the Minister, when she reviews all of these matters, uh, consider in taking uh, away from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency uh, the authority for cross-compliance checking uh, as they are carrying out their duties in such a way uh, that they are damaging farmers' health, their mental health and driving farmers to attempt suicide and the anger in the farming community is actually palpable towards NIEA at this moment in time? Well, the member be aware that NIA comes under the, the remit of the Department of the Environment, but if there, as I said in the early answer, if there are 
new ways of doing things, if there are ways to double up on inspections, if there are ways to improve efficiency, then I'm absolutely up for that and open for it as part of the discussions that we're going to have, particularly in terms of the 15-16 budget in the time ahead. So everything's there and as I said, I'm very prepared to listen to views around how we can do things more efficiently. I'm also aware of the pressure that the farming community are under, particularly if you if even think about the dairy sector and the, cost, uh, the prices that, that they're now um, receiving for their produce. 30% down on this time last year. That's very significant in terms of farm income. There are severe issues in terms of cash flow and management for farmers. So absolutely all those things are putting people under pressure. Um, I would like to think that it's nobody's intention through any department to go out and make things difficult for um, any individual, any farmer. So, as I said um, to your original question, if, if there are any opportunities for us to be able to be more leaner, more efficient and um, cause least disruption to farmers, then I'm absolutely up for that. Call Mr. Datty Mackay. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of uh, next year's budget, will her programme for tackling rural poverty uh, and social isolation be affected? It's one of my policy priorities. Um, I've said um, that I'm absolutely committed to the programme for government commitments that we've made, but Tripsy for me, tackling poverty, rural poverty and isolation is absolutely a key priority policy. We have to be real. This is the only department that's um, ser uh, serious about um, uh, tackling the isolation that's out there, tackling the poverty in rural communities. And the, 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 the pot of money that we've had dedicated to tackling poverty and social isolation has very much leveraged in so much additional funding for rural communities. So for me, um, this is a priority for moving forward and, and I intend to roll out the programme over the next year and indeed uh, in planning for, for budget um, post-15-16. Well, Mr Raymond McCartney for a question. Uh, Kerstin Burkhardt, the whole question number four, please. The responsibility for combating rural crime falls primarily to the Department of Justice and the PSNA. However, I am personally very aware of the concern that farm-related crime causes among the farming community. The Department works on a number of joint initiatives which aim to raise awareness of actions that farmers can take to reduce incidences of rural crime. DARD works closely with DOJ, PSNA and farming organisations on initiatives such as the Farm Watch, the Freeze Branding Initiative and the Crime Stoppers campaign. In addition, the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise students on CAFRI programmes learn about appropriate responses to rural crime through input from visiting speakers, information leaflets and participation of the college farms and PSNI-led programmes such as FarmWatch. In addition, CAFRI has, facilitated, uh, has facilities available which can be used by the PSNI for workshops, seminars and meetings aimed at raising awareness of crime prevention measures among the farming community. I have also ensured that all of the DAR direct offices currently stock rural crime leaflets at the front desk where members of the public can access necessary information in relation to this issue. Call Mr McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. In relation to the, the White Paper, can the Minister perhaps outline what provision have been made for rural communities in particular to be part of the the rollout and the, the discussion and the consultation, particularly in relation to community safety? The, the Rural White Paper Action Plan contains a commitment by the Department of Justice to develop a new community safety strategy, which will ensure that the needs of rural communities are taken into account. The Department of Justice has confirmed that the community safety strategy has been published and action plans for each of the eight strands of activity detailed in the strategy have been developed and agreed by the Justice Committee. One of the eight strands is around reducing the opportunities for crime and includes um, outcomes on supporting safer rural communities and working in partnership with rural groups to prevent and reduce crime. I hope to publish the second annual progress report on the Railway Paper Action Plan next month, which will provide an update on progress by all departments in implementing their commitments in the Action Plan. Call Mr. <coughs> William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I say in my constituency of in the Raider Amma area, uh, it is the highest rural crime in Northern Ireland. Does the Minister, uh, given we have a new rural development programme now uh, coming out next year, does the Minister intend to bring forward any grant aid to help in regard to making farms safer? Um, yes, I mean I, I totally understand that the crime uh, where, where the members are coming from in terms of the district he lives in. I think E District, Neff District are which hold probably about 59% of all farms across the north, but they have the highest 
levels in terms of, of rural crime. So there's a particular focus in, in those districts, and, and rightly so. Um, but yes, I, I think that we should be creative about how we look at grant aid and certain items in, in terms of assistance for farmers in that um, those particular items may have to have some sort of some of these initiatives that we have around stamping items or um, make, making them more safer and, uh, and, and traceable if, if they happen to be stolen. So yes, we are exploring opportunities and, and I'd be um, keen to do that in terms of the rollout of the new um, grant programme. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. It is quite clear that effort has been put in to try and tackle rural crime. Uh, but could the Minister explain there is a perception out there that rural crime has in fact increased? And could the Minister confirm that that is so? And uh, could she give an indication as to why that might be so? I don't have the stats in terms of um, rural crime, given that that's responsibility of the Department of Justice. Um, suffice to say that my department, particularly through our enforcement um, unit and, and through our veterinary side, we work with the other agencies in terms of trying to tackle rural crime. But yes, we did see a rise in terms of, of, um, of crime stats over the last number of years. And as I referred to earlier in, in the previous answer, um, we have seen particular rise in the uh, Clahar area, for example, areas of Manor South Throne um, in, in F district and also in E district. So there, there are particular concerns. My department will play its role in terms of working with the other agencies, but the primary primary uh, responsibility for tackling rural crime rests with the Department of Justice. Well, Mr. Samuel Gardner for question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number five. There are a number of examples within my department of sharing the cost of research and therefore deriving economies of scale. The Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute collaborates with a number of research organisations to maximise the value of several publicly funded research projects, such as the recent project on greenhouse gas emissions, which was funded by DEFRA and the devolved administrations. Another good example of sharing the costs of research with DEFRA and other devolved administrations is the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute, um, the economic research project undertaken by AFPI. This project has been very important in providing an evidence base to support the negotiations and decision making on cap reform, in particular since 2003. Were it not for this sharing of costs, the department would probably be unable to carry out the full cost of this value, valuable analytical tool. In addition, AFPI is currently part of the Farm and Future Strategic Alliance with several research organisations in Britain with the aim of combining their respective resources to maximise value for money for additional research funding applications. A further example of the Department achieving economy of scale would be through its participation in a large multi-provider framework agreement which went live in October. This agreement will facilitate and deliver the provision of services of a veterinary nature to government across England, Scotland and Wales as well as here over the next four years. The Department's Rivers Agency also has strong links with the devolved administrations in relation to flood risk management where economies of scale can be realised in the field of scientific research. For example, the agency is a funding partner on the Coastal Monitoring and Forecasting Service, and that allows the agency to avail of research in relation to coastal flood warning. Mr. Gardner for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, very much for her, her information thus far. But has the Minister considered uh, outsourcing special functions involving administration of, e of EU funding, for example, uh, to units that could serve Scotland and Wales, as well as? Uh, money for three other places? Well, as the member can see from the, from the previous answer, we have um, worked collectively right across the board on, on quite a range of issues, and I'm very open to working across the board in terms of delivering services where that is achievable. Um, we, we're looking at everything in the round, given the difficult economic climate that we're in, we're looking at um, how we do that. We do actually collaboratively work in terms of um, the pen agency that distributes EU funding, so there already is collaboration there. Um, if the member wants to write to me in terms of any specific proposals on um, how else we can take this forward, then I'm very open to receiving that. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlown. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. I, I listened to, importantly there to her as she talked about the emphasis being placed on agri food research and the likes. Um, Last week I was out in Brussels and we heard some sources of various sources of funding and particularly where collaborative work can be done between various institutes, AFPI being one of them. Uh, and I would ask the Minister if she could give us some indication as to the work that is being done both with other regions within Britain and particularly because given the nature of some of the fundings it has to be cross-border or uh, between nation states. 
what work has been done at her department to help draw down those fundings, particularly in regard to the development of projects such as the agri-food sectors? Yes, I mean, AFPE, I have actually tasked them with um, ensuring that we increase our drawdown. Obviously, one of the executive um, programme for government commitments was around drawing down additional money, particularly from Horizon 2020. We have somewhere in the region of approximately about 30 applications that are now with um, Europe for consideration. Um, quite a, a number of them are actually um, uh, in collaboration with other agencies. Um, we, we actually, AFPE came out to Brussels um, to get to know the people that they need to be talking to out there. We have actually explored with them how they can um, be creative about how applications are put forward in working with their partners. I'm very happy to provide the member with the detail of all those collaboration projects that we have. There's too many for me to detail here today, but suffice to say, um, I think the, the work that's been done has been fantastic to date. However, I do think there's scope for additional money to be drawn down, and that's why I've tasked AFPE with actually um, receiving or increasing our EU drawdown in terms of research funding. Call Mrs. Sam for a question. Question number six, please. I can advise the member that the proposed site for the Dard HQ building is approximately 14 acres of the upper part of the Shackleton site. Since being vacated by the British government or British military in 2008, the site has become overgrown with undergrowth and larger vegetation. The site identified for my new headquarters currently has 17 old military buildings and stores, which are all in varying states of disrepair. Each of these buildings has been subject to an asbestos survey and preparations are in place to ensure the safe and efficient um, demolition of these buildings early next year. Although the site has remained secure, a section of the perimeter fence now needs some maintenance and arrangements are already in place to carry out that work. Call Mrs. Over in for supplementary. I uh, thank Mr uh, Deputy Speaker and thank the Minister for, for her answer so far. Though, um, during this process, though, uh, as the Minister has thrown out the rule book on proper process. She has shown contempt for ensuring public value for money um, and overruled concerns of accounting officials, not only in her own department, but of those in OFMD. Do we have a question? Can the Minister tell us, as we stand today, exactly how much will the clean-up of the site, as well as preventing future flooding, cost? Well, I suggest the member has got the wrong department. She should put her question to OFMDFM, given that they are the um, owners of the site. Um, I will make it very clear. I am committed to taking this project forward, so people can protest all they like. There is an uh, executive agreement to the project going forward. The executive has signed off, as the authority of this assembly has signed off on the project going forward. I have um, put a considerable amount of work, as have, has officials, in making sure that we put the case together, that we work with staff, that we plan it out in a phased approach to allow the transition. This is, um, I am actually surprised at the member who is not supportive of taking um, public sector jobs into rural areas, given the constituency it represents. Well, Mr George Robison. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, could the Minister give a rough estimate of how many much-needed jobs will be created when Shackleton Barracks is fully open for business? I can only give um, jobs in terms of my own department. We're talking about 400 in the first phase and then up to 600 in the secondary phase. But I do think the scope and the potential there, both for public sector jobs and private sector jobs, is absolutely enormous given the size of the site. I think the fact that we've had such um, significant numbers of um, companies inquiring as to the future of the site and how they possibly register in their interests as, as a possible um, business that may want to come there is fantastic to see and I look forward to the fruition of that. I think that um, it's up to us to lead the way in terms of um, making sure that Dart headquarters is secure on the site and that work starts and then I think that will open the floodgates for the other businesses that will come after it. And the benefits for that for the North West are absolutely, absolutely tremendous in terms of the job creation, the construction works and all the ongoing um, associated benefits that will come as a result of that. Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I, I hear the Minister's response in, in relation to this, and uh, I hear it in her voice that she's very determined to see this through, and it has almost reached this, the stage of arrogance. Um, could I ask the Minister, in view of the, the horrendous uh, fiscal situation every department is in, and how they've all had to cut back, why and how is she so determined that this will go ahead? And, and, and regarding the other people that have had to cancel or postpone uh, projects? Well, I'm sure the member know me personally would know that arrogance is not in my nature. But I am committed to this project. I am um, committed to taking it forward. This is something that's been worked on for quite a significant period of time. This is about the bigger picture. People need to see the bigger picture. For too long, public sector jobs have all been centred in the Greater Belfast area. That is not a position that we in this assembly should um, continue to, to, to see going forward. 
For me, this is about fair distribution of jobs. It's about the knock-on economic benefit that there will be for all, these, um, all those people who live in the North West, in this case, and all the other relocation projects that I am taking forward. The money has been set aside in the budget. It's all been budgeted. It's um, been taken forward through business case and through all the different procedures. We have executive sign-off. That's why I'm being firm on the position. We have executive sign-off on this project. This is about wider benefits, and people need to, to, to look at it in, in that respect. So it's not my intention to be arrogant. It's my intention to be forthright in that this is a policy priority for myself. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Number two has been withdrawn, and I call Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, for her to state what uh, vision quotas are likely uh, to be issued uh, for the South Down ports of Ardglass and Kilkeel? The member will, will be aware that the three main fishing ports are obviously very dependent on the quotas that are um, being decided upon in, in December. I will be going out to Brussels in December to argue the case once again for the fishing community. And as part of the, the lead up to that, I engaged with the, the fishermen from um, across the three ports. Um, we actually had a, a large stakeholder event over the last um, month, and I intend to meet with fishermen um, this very, actually very shortly over the next number of weeks in terms of our priorities and going forward um, into the December um, negotiating on our quotas for next year. Mrs. McKevitt, first supplement. Um, can I thank the Minister, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for her answer? And in the meeting in the next couple of weeks, um, can I ask the Minister if she bring in, forward any more uh, addition uh, to the quota allocation uh, that will help develop um, uh, the fishing industry in the north? The member will be aware that um, in terms of um, decisions and quotas, it's very much based on a scientific analysis of, um, of the, the, the state of the stock. We will go out to Brussels. We will certainly argue the case for increased quota, as we always do. Um, we have to develop our position with the industry, and I, and I will do that based on the science that we have. Obviously, NEFRAPs, the prawn stock, are the mainstay of the fishing industry here. That will continue to be our priority as part of this negotiation. But I can assure the member that my approach to the negotiation is one that's very much um, agreed on and discussed with the fishing industry and the stakeholders. Ms. Maeve McLaughlin for a topical question. And can I ask the Minister what measures she's taken to um, counteract the avian flu virus? We're taking immediate and robust action in response to a confirmed case of the H5N8 avian flu on a duck breeding farm in eastern Yorkshire. A detailed investigation is ongoing into the possible sources of the outbreak. To date, the, strain has been, or the infection has been re recovered from one wild duck in Germany. Wild birds are suspected as a source, therefore it's imperative that the industry and all wild bird keepers maintain a high level of biosecurity to prevent incursion or onward spread of this disease from wild to the domestic population. My officials have asked specialist organisations to report and submit unusual occurrences of wild fowl deaths. As a precautionary measure, and it, it is precautionary, DART have imposed additional controls on movement of live birds, poultry products and poultry meat common here from parts of Britain since Monday the 17th of November. DART has also introduced a ban on the movement of live birds coming to the north for bird sales and also for pigeon races. I have asked poultry keepers to be vigilant for signs of the disease and to report their suspicions early. I have also, also asked that bird keepers, as a precaution, revisit their own contingency arrangements for housing birds, should that be required, and we are keeping the situation and the veterinary risk assessment under review. We in the north have well tested contingency plans for dealing with the avian flu outbreaks, and that will obviously kick in. Um, and it has kicked in over the last couple of weeks as we've seen this um, established this confirmed case in eastern Yorkshire. Well, Mr McLaughlin for supplementary. Well, good. And I thank the Minister for a very detailed response. But in terms of contingency plans, could the Minister maybe outline uh, what communication has taken place with local industry here? Yes, I mean, given the significance of the poultry industry too, um, locally, um, we have had ongoing discussions with the industry. My officials are making sure that um, all those are, are, are kept up to date. We also have a Q&A on the website, and I encourage people to look at that if they have any doubts. Um, I actually will be meeting some industry if, um, individuals this, um, over the next couple of days also to discuss the situation, because obviously there is a trade implication for them, given the restrictions that we've introduced as a precautionary ma measure. My officials are also working with both DEFRA and also with DAFM in the south, because for me, this is a, another one of those instances where the Fortress Ireland approach would um, 
um, be absolutely key um, if we're able to uh, maintain our free status of, of the disease. Call Mrs. Brenda Hill for topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what four areas she has selected for remote sensing inspections and have the farmers in those areas been informed? Um, as I told the House last year in the back of the review where we looked at the areas that were chosen, um, that um, all those farmers that have been selected for remote sensing will be informed in a speedy manner as I can um, do that. Um, I believe that has happened over the last number of weeks that those people have been informed that they have been subject to inspection, not to remote inspection, but subject to inspection. And my objective, and I've set very clear targets for the department, and we're thriving, and it's um, to, to make sure that I deliver on them, that we're going to have over 500 people paid who've been subject to inspection this year in December, which is significantly improved on last year's situation. But the ultimate aim is to have the majority of people paid uh, by the end of the year, and I, um, I believe that we'll reach our target. Mrs. Hill for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer and given that you're saying the farmers have already been informed, what are you doing to support the four areas so that the scenario of last year doesn't happen again and considering that you, you yourself have recognised the increasing pressure that farmers are under? Absolutely recognise the increasing pressure that farmers are under and in terms, as, as I've said, the numbers of people that will be remaining unpaid um, at the end of the year will be low. However, if you're in that small category of people, you'll be under pressure. So we're working with the department to make sure that we get these payments, because the most significant thing I can do to support this industry is make sure that all these payments are paid ASAP. So my intention is to be as close to the 100% as we can get by the end of the year. There will be remaining cases dealt with over January and February, but I believe and I know we will be in a far better position than we were last year. It won't be any comparison. Mr. John McAllister is not in his place. I call Mr. Ian Mill. Minister, in terms of the Rivers Agency relocation to Lockery, what benefits is there for the local community? I think, yeah, it's been well rehearsed in question time today, but I'm absolutely committed to taking that forward. Moving jobs to any location is going to bring the inevitable benefits um, to the local community of both the construction. Um, about bringing uh, a public service into the heart of our rural communities and I absolutely am um, committed to taking forward the project. In terms of Rivers Agency, the um, plan application has been submitted. We're talking in the region of about 80 posts that will be relocating so, to, to the Lockery area, so that's going to bring significant economic benefits to the Cookstown area, um, as I said, through construction, servicing of a building, the increased footfall, so then the increased spending in, in the community. So um, it's something that I know that the Cookstown community in particular are very keen to see, given that um, the, the, I suppose the, the stop-start nature of the Desert Creek project, and whilst um, I, I am certainly committed to seeing that through. I, for me, Rivers Agency is, is a um, project that's certainly on the move. It's um, on target for delivery. Well, Mr. Millen, for supplementary. Well, my good uh, last can call your August Mawekas down there. Done a Friday the G show. Can I ask the, uh, thank the speaker and I thank the minister for answering this far. Uh, what is the time frame exactly then for this relocation? Well, my good. Yes, as I said, the plan application is in and work is undergoing on the site. We expect that um, the move will be completed by March 2016. Well, Mr. Trevor Clark for a topical question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister, I'm sure, is quite aware in terms of the recent flooding incidents in terms of well, different areas over the province. But, Minister, do you believe that uh, Rivers Agency is adequately resourced to actually deal with the problem? Yes, I mean, I think you have to look at every flood incident, incident in its um, own merits in terms of where floods and why and what have been the contributory factors. One of the um, positive things I think that we do in terms of Rivers Agency is that after an incident, we take a look at the incident, look at what were the contributory factors, what can be improved, and th that's something that happens on an ongoing basis, and we learn lessons and improve things or change practices if that's what's needed. Mr. Clark, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer. However, would the Minister accept, or I'm well, sure she'll not accept, that sometimes it seems that Rivers Agency is more reactive rather than proactive? And in terms of we're coming into that, that particular time of the year where more likelihood of flooding, um, are you minded, Minister, to make them more reactive rather than pro or, sorry, more, more proactive rather than reactive? I mean, there's always room for improvement across every area of service, and I, I, I'm open, I absolutely accept that. Um, I think the member would be surprised to know the, the detailed um, number of inspections, grill inspections, clearing drains, all the things that Rivers Agency do. So they are very proactive in nature. Um, but as I said, is there always a way to improve things? Yes, of course there is, and, and I'm always open to that. But maybe it would be useful if I sent the member um, just a wee bit of a background on the types of work that they do all year round in terms of planning for um, 
times when we have prolonged weather, such as we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Ms Bromlin, we get for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister how has she acted uh, to protect her priorities in terms of the budget for 15-16? Well, as I said the, earlier, the, the budget, um, draft budget position is going to the committee and they'll fully discuss it tomorrow. We're into the period of consultation and I look forward to engaging with all stakeholders in terms of um, their response to, to, to um, what I've set out in terms of my proposals and moving forward. I've clearly set out that I have policy priorities, particularly around tackling poverty and isolation, around supporting those farmers who farm hard um, to farm land, particularly those in the LFA or ANC. Um, around, I want to make sure that we have rural development programmes spent on the ground next year, as soon as it's signed off by, by Europe. I want to um, move forward with um, all the programme for government commitments and making sure that um, any approach to the, to the budget, I come at it from a very fair and balanced approach and try and, uh, as, were, as far as we possibly can, not imp impacting on frontline services. So that's what I've resolved to do to deliver uh, um, in terms of DARD's budget in the time ahead. But we're absolutely entering into a period of consultation with stakeholders and um, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to the discussion with them because these are difficult um, economic climate to, to be in, not least because of the extent of the Tory cuts to our overall block grant. Ms. McGahan for supplementary. Uh, Gurmi Ogad, I, I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, what, what further revenue raising opportunities are available, uh, available for consideration by your department? Yes, I think it's important that all departments look at um, how they can raise funds as opposed to just um, look, looking for savings. So I think um, in moving forward, you have to have a combination of, of both. From my department's point of view, we are looking at how we can increase our EU drawdown in terms of research funding, and that's something which we've um, tasked AFPI to do. We're looking at forest service and how we can increase our receipts um, in terms of the, the timber sales. So there, there are opportunities for us within the department to actually look at realising additional um, funding. We also are going to look at how can we... Um, in terms of forest service land, is there any potential in terms of wind farm development? How can we maximise income for communities and the department? So there are quite a range of things that we're exploring as part of revenue raising um, proposals and, and, and I'm keen to, to continue to explore them because I do think it's incumbent upon us as ministers of department to look at not just savings but also revenue raising um, opportunities if we have them. I'll miss Claire Sugden for a topical uh, question. Thank you. Uh, will the Minister agree with me that some members of this House are frustrated with the Ballycally proposal because for once the Northern Ireland Executive is investing significantly outside Greater Belfast? Yes, there certainly is a lot of reluctance to, to the move, but as I said earlier, I'm absolutely committed to, to taking it forward. And I do um, see the bigger picture in terms of the wider benefits and the fair distribution of public sector jobs. I'm Sugden for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and I'll ask the Minister again, could she reiterate the long-term benefits, and I mean in respect of the local economy, that the Ballykelly proposal will have both for the North West and for Northern Ireland? Yes, I mean, in this particular project, given the size of the site and the potential, not just for my department to move to Ballykelly, but also the private sector investment that will come to the North West as a result of one department taking the initiative to move Lock, Stock and Barrel to the Ballykelly site. So the benefits in terms of the DARD move itself are around fair distribution of public sector jobs, are around the construction um, jobs that are going to be created, are around the footfall in, in the area, so the increased spending. So the, in terms of DARD loan, there, there are significant benefits, but those benefits are obviously relevant to all the other investment that comes um, on the back of the DARD move from the private, um, the private sector and I look forward to, to being able to, to take that forward and as I said I'm absolutely committed to taking it forward and I've budgeted for it in terms of budget discussions and plans. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister when does she propose to visit Brussels uh, to meet the new Agriculture Commissioner Mr. Hogan? I believe Mr Hogan will be here um, over the next number of months and I'll be engaging with him then. I've actually written to him on a few occasions now and will work with him in his position as new commissioner. Um, obviously we have some issues which we want to pursue with him and have um, recently written to him just around greening because the commissioner dragging their feet in terms of um, giving some clarification that um, our industry deserves and is seeking. 
McGuinness for supplement. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm glad that the Minister will meet Mr Hogan very soon. And I do know that she has been writing to him to congratulate him on his new position, uh, which was very helpful to him in the nomination process. But uh, could I ask, uh, given the serious uh, problems that there are with the dairy industry, wouldn't it be appropriate to meet with him as soon as possible in order to try and out, uh, iron out some of the difficulties within the uh, dairy industry here in Northern Ireland? Well, I can assure the member that I'm mature enough that I may have my political views on individuals, but I can certainly, um, in my role as Minister of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, I will work with whoever I need to work with in terms of um, securing what is the best outcome and securing discussions on, um, on numerous issues right across um, my department's area of responsibility. So um, that, 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 that's, that, that's um, a given. So I will certainly be working with uh, Minister Hogan and with um, others in Europe that are relevant in terms of the challenges that we um, um, are presented with, and, and I will do that with both our MEPs and then um, right across the, the European Parliament, also with the Commission, Commissioner Hogan and his officials. Order, time is up. Uh,